Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. So I'm going to give a soft talk today. I'm not going to give a hard talk. No. I'm going to give um, a talk on care and feeding of Ruby developers. So um, one of the things I'd like to do as we go is feel free to jump up with questions. This isn't the kind of talk where we need to wrap up all the questions at the end. Um, it's going to be pretty informal. And I've threw together some, some notes, some ideas from my experience. And uh, one of the great things about giving a soft talk like this as opposed to a um, hard talk, um, first off, you can't prove me wrong. <laughs> and the second thing is, um, it, it's, uh, uh, well, I don't remember what the second thing was. Anyway, so, because my notes aren't, oh, there are my notes. Look at that. That's awesome. Okay, so the premise of the talk is that it's useful to know more about ourselves and our community as developers. Um, I'll say why it's useful at the end. It'll be the cliffhanger, but I suspect that uh, you know it's pretty easy to argue uh, that it's useful um, right off the bat. Um, so let me tell you sort of what's going to happen in the talk. Um, I'm going to talk about a few sort of key areas, some important qualities. Um, and I'm going to talk about aesthetics first, even though it's listed last. Um, we're going to talk about collaboration, planning, stars, and care and feeding, which is sort of the uh, homage to the title. Uh, the idea here is to come up with a set of qualities that, <clears throat> that characterize the community and the developers, really from my experience. Um, so again, like I said, it's going to be hard to prove me wrong, because I'll just say that's my experience, and, and, and acknowledge your experience, and then we'll move on. Um, but it'll be useful for some good discussions. Uh, please jump in if you disagree with me. OK, so um, we know this is not, hopefully, the status quo for working in our community. Um, it might be in some places, but more than just a representation of a particular place, it's a particular style of working, a particular style of what it is we produce. I don't think this represents us well at all. Um, so what does? What are some of the qualities that are really important to the developers? What are some of the qualities important to the community and the people that belong to them? Um, probably one of the first and most prominent when I started thinking about this subject was the notion of aesthetics. Um, I've had the opportunity to be in a number of different communities over my career. I started off working, uh, being a Unix kernel hacker um, back when it was just Unix and uh, version 6, version 7. And the kind of people in that community, uh, certainly there were a sense of aesthetics, but it was a narrow sense of aesthetics. Um, <clears throat> and, and we'll have some photos to illustrate that later if you, if you can make it that long. Um, and then I had the chance to be involved in you know, desktop Windows software, which was a period that I'm glad I forgot about. Um, Web 1.0, and then now, you know, whatever we call this next waves. Um, so the thing that really attracted me to this community, honestly, one, right off the bat, was the fact that aesthetics to me, what I saw was pervasive across the community. It wasn't just aesthetics, the visual aesthetics, of uh, some, some aspect of the community, but it went all over the place. There was aesthetics of software design. People had a strong opinions and strong feelings about software design. Um, certainly, you can find that in other communities. Uh, but that was a key part of the conversations I had with folks as I got to know um, uh, different developers in the community. Uh, visual design aesthetics was surprisingly high, having spent a lot of time with folks who um, were really excited when they showered once a week and um, you know, when they got a little percent in the flashy arrow. Uh, the notion of aesthetics, visual design aesthetics, being sort of essential to the work that they did was very, uh, I was very pleased to run across that because it was one of the things that I always felt uncomfortable about in, in, in other communities. Um, you know, a little plug for our work, that's uh, some of our design, uh, some of our visualization work that we've done on one of our products called TuneUp. Uh, I used it there because I think it's a great example of visual aesthetics. It's really cute looking, it's pretty, and it's also functional, so it's not just eye candy. There are lots of other examples. Um, it's interesting to note that the work 37 Signals has done, some of their notions of uh, visual elements 
has, has persisted out into all different parts of the web, independent of Ruby or Rails, I see design elements from their work all over the place. So these guys are known, obviously, for their technical abilities, but also for their, their aesthetics, their design abilities, uh, which would make sense given their backgrounds. Um, aesthetics of work environment. Um, this one, you know, in some ways, this one's a little one hard to judge. Uh, everybody likes a nice place. Nobody likes to say they work in a broom closet, which coincidentally, I actually happen to work in a broom closet right now. Um, but um, we have got a community of people, in my experience, who care a lot more about the environments in which they work in because it is, uh, because aesthetics are high on their list of important things. The visual, the you know, auditory, all of the different aspects of their work environment are important. And one of the things I've discovered is they will find a good place to work if you don't provide it. And coffee shops around the country are benefiting as a result. Um, certainly in Austin, we've seen that. Um, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's so sexy. <laughs> That's right. So we've got really three important people, or three important creatures on this. Um, <laughs> that dog is hot. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of silly, but, it's, but this is another thing that I noticed, was that in this community, people really cared about how they looked. Now, in other communities, people cared about their look, but the degree to which they cared, the, the, the importance that that ranked, wasn't as high as what I find in this community. Now, I do work with a bunch of guys that look like they belong to a boy band. Um, mostly Adam here on your left, along with his partner, the dog. Um, but, but seriously, these folks, um, in my experience, uh, the notion of aesthetics pervades all over the place. It doesn't just stop at a good design, a good architecture, um, a good office space. Um, to contrast that with previous generations, uh, <laughs> Richard Stallman, I think, represents maybe a different aesthetic, <laughs> or maybe that that aesthetic is not as important as some of the other things that he uh, focused on. Um, I worked with a lot of people that looked like that, so I was sensitive to the notion that, that, that uh, it could be different. Um, OK. Collaboration. Collaboration's baked into the community from the beginning, and that's one of the things I was really, I really noticed That'd be my phone. Wow. I'll just put this on the stage. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> if you want to break anything, just bring it up here. Um, all right, so collaboration is baked in uh, from the beginning in the community, is my experience. Um, uh, you know, as you may or may not know, the folks that I work with include Adam Keyes, Bruce Williams, um, who do have, you know, some somewhat of a uh, familiarity in the community. Um, one of the things I noticed about their working style right off the bat was um, they naturally collaborated not just with folks in the building, but with folks elsewhere, independent of a particular project. So collaboration really showed up in a lot of different ways. Um, and one of the values of collaboration, I mean, this is, this is a little bit like mom and apple pie, but one of the values of collaboration that I think we as a community have sort of inherited from the larger open source culture is this notion that um, we get course correcting feedback. The feedback loop is closed. It's pretty tight as a result of that collaboration. If you're building something that's relevant and it's built well, it'll get adoption. If you're building something that's relevant and it stinks, you'll hear about it. Um, or you'll become irrelevant. If you're building something that's not even interesting, you'll become irrelevant. And it's pretty easy and pretty quick to find that out because of all of the tight and loose collaborations that we have in the community. And um, I think that's a tremendously valuable characteristic of the community. I, yeah, I couldn't pretend to know why that's occurred, but I think it's one of those huge, huge assets that's, uh, that's true in our community. Um, I don't have any good pictures for the next few slides. I wish I did, but I wasn't that creative. Um, independent of physical location, the collaboration occurs. Collaboration just isn't a matter of the fact that it happened to be in the same room. The teams that I've worked with, the folks that I'm working with, they don't think anything about getting on iChat and collaborating with someone 
we've got folks who are in Dallas, we've got folks who are in, uh, someone's in Scotland, we've got, uh, so, so distance, while it does have an impact, is really less of an issue than ever that I've seen before. And of course, you know, a lot of us get away with it from the technology that we've got and what have you. Um, but, but the notion of being able to work in a distributed manner is something that's, that we inherited very well from the open source, uh, the general open source community. Um, independent of organizational boundaries. This is one that I appreciated but thought it would be kind of, kind of challenging for some folks. Um, in my experience, people don't have a problem in this community collaborating across organizational boundaries. They don't look up first and say, is this my team? Is this my company? Is this other person potentially in a competitive relationship with somebody that I am collaborating with? That parsing doesn't seem to go on. It's, it's really more a fundamental question of, I've got a technical problem, I want to solve it. And who's the right person I can reach out to to solve it? And I think the parsing of the organizational boundaries really don't occur or don't occur until, you know, well downstream from there. Um, the nice thing is, is, is that problems get solved with the right people getting together on them. And they don't have to worry about getting uh, those connections vetted by somebody. One of the side effects of this is that, and this is Horton, by the way, who's looking to see if there's anybody in there. Do you guys know the story of Dr. Seuss, Horton and the Who? Do you guys have anybody ever a child here? Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so Horton's the only one that could tell those guys were alive. They weren't doing enough things that made it obvious to the rest of the world that they were alive. Horton happened to be a particularly sensitive character. Um, one of the things I've discovered in, as part of the sort of rich fabric of collaboration that occurs in this community, if you're not doing something, makes it obvious you're alive, you're not posting blogs, you're not contributing code, if you're not insulting somebody, um, if you're not up on stage doing talks, you know, whatever, people begin to mentally, I think, start to say, well, you know, their, their aliveness is dropping and therefore their relevance and therefore their degree of collaboration. And so um, one of the side effects of this collaboration is, is people get a sense of sort of what's stale and what's not stale simply because there's lots of ambient noise, ambient background information about um, what's going on with people and projects. And uh, I think that shows up later in one of my recommendations. I'll make sure people know you're alive. Uh, okay, off of collaboration, on to, um, there, on to another topic. Um, and this one was planning. I sort of had a hard time trying to figure out what category to call this. Um, I didn't want to call it managing, because uh, it really isn't about managing. And my point is sort of the opposite of managing. Um, but I, I guess the point that I want to sort of drill in first to is um, the doing of the work on the projects that I've had the opportunity to either see or be involved with the doing is really close to the planning. And that's in contrast to a lot of um, projects that I've seen elsewhere where the people making the decisions about what is to be done, what's to be sold, what's to be built, what's to be serviced, are at some amount of distance from the people actually doing the work. And uh, you know, to a great degree, some of the technology, some of the frameworks, Rails obviously being you know, the, the big one here, some of the technologies that we have make it possible for the people who are the implementers to also be the planners because you know, they've got more mental capacity to handle that because of all the benefits we get from some of the um, smarts delivered by the framework. Um, I don't think that's unique to our community. We inherited some of that from the open source culture, uh, but I think we have that a little more pumped up because we've packaged up a lot of our smarts and delivered it and collaborate well on it. One of the side effects is, I think this potentially results in more stars. You guys like the little asterisks I put there? I thought that was really catchy visual design. Um, and by stars, I mean things like this, where you get beautiful people on the cover of Wired Magazine talking about their frameworks and their products. And it's those people who are actually doing the creation of the work or actually the people who are coming up with the ideas for the work. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I've certainly been on a lot of projects where the opposite is true. Um, so, 
carrying on this similar theme is the notion of living on the edge with the latest stuff. Um, here we have, uh, I don't actually even know if we know his name. Do we know his name? This is another Dr. Seuss character. We know Sam I Am is trying to get him to eat this green eggs and ham. That he's the guy that won't eat it because it's a little too edgy. Yeah, he's the guy. Yeah. Um, anyway, so he's sort of not certain about living on the edge here about eating this green eggs and ham. Um, and, and, you know, eventually he does. He's good with it. And uh, one of the benefits that we get by living on the edge and, uh, is that we get to have that tight feedback loop that gets us improvements quickly. Uh, once we have this you know, great collaborative fabric set up, all the different informal ways that we collaborate, um, what, what smarter people than me would talk about, social graphs and what have you, um, we have lots of different ways to push improvements to each other rapidly and to take advantage of them. Um, and that works because the feedback loop is closed because we have the collaborative mechanisms that if you do good work, people know about it. If you do, if your work stinks, people know about it. If you're irrelevant, people know about it. And so it makes it possible to live on the edge with the latest changes of code. And, and you know, from personal experience, we're picking up edge stuff about you know, edge rails or you know, gems that are being tweaked, what have you, in some of the work that we're doing on a regular basis. And a lot of what comes with it is the knowledge that the people that are behind it, uh, we trust because of the collaborative fabric that we're in together. If the opposite were true, and we were at the end of one long pipeline where it took months and months for things to go through long processes to finally get to us, then the rate of change obviously would be so much lower for, for us, for our community. Um, and I think it would severely hamper a lot of, uh, of the great results that we've seen. So um, there's a neat set of trade-offs that have occurred there. Um, enlightened capitalists. Now this is one of the differences I've actually seen uh, in this community versus some other communities that I've, I've been involved in. Um, from the open source world, I think the notion of passion plus some amount of useful action is rewarded. And for a lot of open source communities, that reward is personal reputation or the convenience of having some new functionality available for yourself and maybe for a small group of people. I think, um, maybe not uniquely, but I think in a great way, this community is finding how to turn that into capital, turn that into money, not by selling the source code, because sort of carrying on our lineage from the open source world, source code is, is of less importance but what seems to be of great importance is the delivery of services. I mean, we see obviously the 37 signal stuff and lots of other people are delivering software as a services. We're also seeing people deliver services, services, humans going out and talking to other humans. Um, so the, the actual code itself as, a, as something to, um, that it's, you know, has cash value associated with it really seems to have gone by the wayside courtesy of the uh, open source community. Um, ultimately, what, we're, what I'm seeing though that, that's, that's, that, that is nice is people love this stuff and they also want to make a living doing it. They don't see those two in opposition to each other. So um, that's a bunch of qualities that I went over and now I thought I'd drill into some few suggestions about sort of care and feeding. But before I did that, you guys feel free to jump in with any questions. No questions? Okay, good. Um, so, care and feeding. Um, so, at times I'm idealistic about this. I think having some awareness of these qualities of our community is just a good thing in, its, in and of itself. That, um, that that awareness will in one way or another affect the decisions that we make. Um, more of the human decisions. Um, as I mentioned to somebody while I was furiously finishing the last few minutes of this talk in the green room, um, he was working on his talk at 2.30, and he was working on code samples. Um, that's very concrete. You know what to do with stuff like that. You know, you might type rake at some point and do something and get some result. Mine, the kind of stuff I'm delivering, it's more like clip art. And there's not as concrete results that you can expect out of it. So the sort of general category of, 
awareness of this of these uh, qualities, I think is useful and and becomes useful in a pervasive way. However, I do have some specifics. Um, a lot of it depends on the purpose that you've got in mind. Um, and I think one of the most fundamental questions of uh, the, sort of wrapping all this information up and asking what, to, what you can do with it is, um, how well do these qualities match the other communities that you might be involved with? And when I talk about communities, I'm not just talking about technical communities. Um, I'm talking about the companies you might be embedded in, or the customers you might be collaborating with. Uh, Having some amount of meta perspective of realizing what the qualities of our community and the qualities of the people that work in our community uh, and then comparing those against other places where you might be um, gives you a little bit of a chance to know whether there's going to be some amount of mismatch or not. Um, so let me drill into some specifics. So in your environment that you, you, know, that you do your work in, where you're doing your passion in, um, Collaboration. Obviously, I'm you know spent some time talking about how important I believe that is. How well are you supporting or blocking uh, the different forms of collaboration? Collaboration occurs in all sorts of different mediums, with all sorts of different tools. We've spent a lot of time. Um, we continue to tweak how we collaborate, both inside of our our immediate teams and with folks that we have more looser collaborations with, um, allowing for serendipity where you have the chance to chat with this fellow because it's not because it serves some immediate tactical purpose, but it in some ways benefits everybody. Um, obviously conferences like this are great, but you know, there's a huge sort of you know, cost to making this happen. So all those, you know, how to create those serendipitous collaborations uh, as well as the ones you know you have to have. Um, Crossing organizational boundaries, I think in bigger companies, bigger corporations, ones that maybe have established earlier generation development approaches, the notion of freely crossing organizational boundaries without having to get that vetted by somebody would freak people out. Um, so as a heads up, um, that mismatch is an interesting mismatch and one that I suspect that, that uh, um, you know, we've seen that before when the open source culture bumps into proprietary culture. And I think we'll continue to see sort of that having to be rounded, the corners rounded on that one. Um, and lastly, when we talk about collaboration, collaboration extends beyond just the technical community. Um, in, in where we're working now, where I'm working now, we have, uh, it's a small team, about 18 people, a few of which do marketing, a few of which do sales, the majority of which do development, but you know, it's safe to say that some of the conversations that we have in the scopes outside of development, the collaboration between development and those groups, those tribes are really critical, but they don't speak the same language. And recognition that in fact those languages are different, I think is sort of one of those mom and apple pies that everybody understands is important. Uh, but it's too easily sort of lost in, uh, as, as we do our daily stuff. More specifics. Um, I mentioned this earlier, sort of in the notion of Horton. Do you look alive to others in your community? Um, more than any other community I've had, ever had the chance to be involved with, um, what I'm seeing is folks are doing lots of, you know, they have a lot of presence online in lots of different forms. And, you know, whether it's Twitter, you know, friend feed, whether you're, whatever it is you're doing, blogs, what have you, that to a great degree is how people know um, you're present. And um, that, I, I hope that stays important to the community. Um, locus of control, that's a fancy word, fancy phrase that I, I knew before, but I had to look it up at Wikipedia to make sure I really knew what it meant. But essentially it means um, where you're perceived uh, control is over the decisions and direction, uh, what you're doing, um, where the perceived control of that is. And I think in, uh, in a lot of the projects, as I mentioned, that I've had the experience on, the locus of control is very close. The people doing the work are actually the people making decisions about what should be done. So watch out for those projects in which that's not true. Because they may look similar, but they're not. And there's lots of lots of um, side effects that come from that being different. 
And there's a lot of side effects that come from getting people who don't understand that quality. If you're getting people into your group who don't know that the locus of control is where it is for y'all, if it's close and it's in, you know, close to you, and they're not used to that, my experience is those people spend a lot of time on idle, waiting for someone to tell them what to do. And that doesn't work really well. So when you're vetting people, clients or customers or staff or you know, drinking buddies, what have you, check that out. That might be one of those things you want to see how well it matches or mismatches. Um, plan for people that blend technical and aesthetics. Uh, I think I overused the term aesthetics there. But my point being that in this community, there are a lot of people who have a history of being designers or working in the visual arts or working in theater or what have you. And they bring that to the technical. Um, that, I think, really impacts the, how we do our work, how we live our work, how we sort of, what the aesthetics are, obviously. So plan that that's true. Uh, and the corollary to that is, is look at the people coming into your world who are interested in being more involved and see if they match that for y'all. See if they match that level of aesthetic interest. And if they're not, um, you know, figure out if that's the right fit. Doesn't have to, doesn't have to be a problem. Just, just have some awareness of it. Um, and then the, the last bullet I've got here is uh, people will find nice places to work, make that happen. When we moved our offices recently, uh, we were at a very classic sort of grade A office space in way the hell out of town from my point of view. Uh, you know, beautiful office, you know, exterior. Uh, everybody that was there wanted to move to a place that was downtown where we could walk to lots of coffee shops, where we had funky industrial feel versus marble in the lobby. And um, until we moved there, a great number of us spent a lot of time driving our cars to lots of places that felt like the where we wanted to be. We spent time in coffee shops. We spent time at each other's houses doing work. Even though we had a full office space, people wanted to find a place that worked and felt like how they work and feel. You want to avoid this problem. <laughs> that is the clip art that um, <laughs> Depends on the time of day and the purpose of the, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, right. This is, the, uh, this is the clip art that I found at the 11th hour. And, and um, Rain and Bruce Williams both said, uh, I, I will have failed them if I didn't put this in there and find some, some measly connection. I suppose the connection is, Make sure you get an office space that people feel good about and they don't have to fight when they come in their cubicle. <laughs> OK, that's right. Other than that, Bruce, do you want to come in on that for us, Bruce? Oh, thank you. Uh, so that's been my tour of this sort of soft subject. Uh, it's a shot in the dark. Uh, I really wanted to see if it was worth getting out there. I hope it's uh, been useful. And I'd be happy to entertain some questions if you've got any. Oh, question. Pre premature clapping, there was one or two questions. Go ahead. How much do you think of the company? You know, what you said in the company doing room or rail development versus small companies or startups? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Uh, thanks. Yeah. How much do I think? what I talked about, the qualities that I talked about are unique to the Ruby and Rails uh, community versus just companies doing, uh, you know, small startup companies doing development. I think there's a lot of overlap, but um, I haven't, I didn't build a taxonomy well enough to say this one maps uniquely to Ruby. Uh, there are uh, a number of qualities. More than anything, I think it's sort of the aggregation of these qualities. Uh, to me are indicative of the Ruby community. I think you'll see a lot of these other qualities in small startups, but this is sort of the, the intersection of the two, I think is, is more the case, not, 
I think this is more of a prototype for really the, uh, uh, these qualities are in the Ruby and Rails startups. Uh, Ruby and Rails community, though you'll find some of these in other startups. I get, does that make sense? Was that well formed? Because it sounded like crap to me. <laughs> so the short answer is, I believe that these qualities, you'll see most of these in the Ruby and Rails community. And I believe you'll see some of them in general software startups. But the highest count will be in the Ruby and Rails. Okay, that was better. Yes? So how do you propose, it sounds like you have a very enlightened management staff. Oh, he's brilliant. I. You know, that, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting question. I wish I had a great answer, and I've made the mistake of working for small startups who wanted to have some of this, but the impact of, sort of key folks in a small startup, if they weren't willing to go there, it wasn't going to happen. And, and when in particular, it didn't happen because the, the, man, the CEO, the founder, just, you know, there were some of the qualities that I talked about that he just couldn't get to. And it wasn't going to happen full stop. Um, and as to how you pull that off into a larger sort of corporate context, I mean, that's an interesting conversation. We had a, I had a variation on that conversation last night with some folks. And honestly, the best answer I have is probably one that's not always legitimate, which is, try and spin up separate groups where they can have their own culture. I mean, it's so onerous to change cultures. And the culture is the way it is for a reason. And it's almost like you want to get out of the way and let it keep going. But to stand in front of that truck, uh, you know, I've got a few scars from that. So that's a great question. Did I, he asked how to do that into a larger, how to actually change existing cultures. I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Yes. It takes a lot of passion and a lot of persistence. We're dealing with that very much so at Yellow Pages, where we come, I mean, we're owned by AT&T. We've got a rail-based application that we're building and trying to pull the Ruby community into it and to push our employees and engineers out into the community more. But I think there's a whole world of software developers out there that don't know what these conferences are like. Right. Yeah. 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 There's a variation of that. I mean, sort of along those lines. One of our experiences at Five Runs was at one point we reduced the development staff down to. Um, this is prior to my my tenure there. Um, we reduced it basically down to one person, but that was that was Bruce. Bruce Williams, and we built up around him, and so so if we're good, it's his fault, and if we're bad, it's also his fault. But um, uh, but the net effect was that finding a person or a group of people who can strongly hold on to the qualities you think are important and keep them alive, keep them sort of you know bound together to be the catalyst that that you attract more people onto, I think is critical. If you have one or two, if the bad stuff outweighs the good stuff, it's a, you know, have my hats off to people to try and do it. It's hard. Brian, do you have a question? Uh, this is just kind of adding on to uh, what we asked before, but I've seen um, a movement towards this uh, more, for, for lack of a better word, agile um, type of theme inside uh, a larger entrenched enterprise by taking um, three members from a larger team that were kind of in this dead-end project that was like a year over budget and scope, and taking three people and spinning them off into a sort of separate side-related project. And when those three operated kind of semi-autonomously, -autonom 
Independent. <laughs> <laughs> um, they ended up sort of uh, pooling their Yeah, that makes I sense. Uh, in, in That's a good point. Any other questions? Oh, one back there. So, so yeah, the, 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 the point that I, let me try and repeat your point so everybody can hear it. I think the point you're making is while, while the locus of control as, as, a, as a quality for developers is really important, there's also another aspect which is um, what amount of control do the customers have in influencing how the company goes, how the product direction goes or service direction might go. And um, I'd, I agree with you, I think that's important. Uh, to me that sort of goes to that feedback loop as, you know, in that keep alive, that heartbeat, if, if you're producing something that's, if you're frequently producing something that announces your existence and the results are relevant, then, then that guides the ship in the right direction. If it doesn't, if the customers treat you as irrelevant or worse, then hopefully the collaboration is still rich enough that people get that information back and, and course correct. Because ultimately the people I've seen that don't course correct is because they aren't getting information about, I mean, about the things are going bad. Nobody I've met really says, I'm gonna keep doing this bad thing because it's wrong even though everybody tells me uh, just because I love doing it unless they've got some sort of you know drinking problem. So. Right. Ah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, that's probably a, that's probably a whole other discussion about sort of the trade-off between what feels right at the moment versus um, what might be right per for some some set of audience, some set of customers. Any other? Control issue. Um, you're going to have to have external forces dictating a lot of what gets done, mm -hmm. but the developers can get a lot of the satisfaction of local control by not dictating in any way how they do what they do. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. So you can separate a lot of the what and the how and still accomplish that kind of psychological goal. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So he's so for those of you who didn't hear, he said with respect to locus control, by separating out what versus how, I think if what comes in as messages from outside of the the a group of developers, then the how as decided upon by the developers, the locus of control to a great degree is their own. Um, I also think that when you start to collaborate with other tribes like the marketing tribe and the you know and the sales tribe. They have their own language, they see things, and they interpret stuff that's valid in their world, and they translate it to us. And part of that translation ultimately comes down to do you trust the, the data you're getting from them? And so um, if you do trust it, then it's sort of up to you to react to it in a way that's, you know, that's, that's honorable. Otherwise, if not, you're sort of in the situation going, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So yeah, good point. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.